I don't like people saying cash flow is safe. It's not. Any of us that own real estate know living off cash flow is incredibly risky and difficult to do because you don't know when things are going to go wrong. It's, it's a very unstable foundation. So I was surprised to say the least when I saw a recent Bigger Pockets video by David Green with the thumbnail, Don't Use Cash Flow to Retire Early. I was surprised because since about 2017, when I was 37 years old, my family and I have been living off the cash flow from our investment properties, including a 17 month time period when we lived in Ecuador. Also back in 2018, I wrote a book for Bigger Pockets called Retire Early with Real Estate, which taught people how to use investment properties to pay their bills so they could retire early. So in this video, I thought I would share my response to David's video and show you how you can use investment properties to live off the cash flow and retire early. If we haven't met yet, my name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a channel all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Oh, where do I want to start with this? <laughs> your answer is correct, or your comment is correct. Cash flow is very unreliable. And this is so important to me because I feel like it gets framed like cash flow is safe and appreciation is speculative. And I believe that comes from 2010 when we saw the market crash because people were betting on appreciation and not looking at cash flow. And they would have kept their home if they would have bought cash flowing properties. So a couple things. David is 100% correct. There is a stigma from 2009 and 10 about cash flow compared to appreciation because a lot of people got burned. People who depended on appreciation, builders, homeowners, investors, most of them aren't in the game anymore. They had to get back in the game. They went bankrupt or they lost money. They had to turn their properties back over to foreclosure. And I was an investor before the recession, 2003, four, five, six, seven. My business partner and I were buying a lot of properties and we were flipping properties. We were selling rental properties. The saving grace for us though, in addition to just having big cash reserves, was cash flow, was the ability to keep our tenants in properties, to finance properties to people, to get that monthly recurring income. Now, we make a lot of money with appreciation over time, and we did as well, both before and after the recession. But the thing that 2008 and 9 demonstrated is when things get crazy, you fall back to your foundation, which is monthly cash flow. And I also disagree. This is not just a 2010 thing. This is a thing over, you look at the entire history of real estate markets, you look at the history of stock markets. One thing Warren Buffett always invests on is the earnings of a company. He wants to increase the earnings over time. And yes, make money over the price as well. But earnings are your foundational thing that you always come back to, not just with 2010. This is a kind of a long-term trend that I think will still be around. The problem is, Appreciation is unreliable because you don't know what the market's going to do. You cannot control it. But cash flow is unreliable because you don't know what your tenant's going to do or your property's going to do. You also can't control that. So here's where I'm going to have to disagree with Mr. Green just a little bit because what I hear him saying is that appreciation and cash flow are equally unreliable. And that just hasn't been my experience. And I'm going to take a play from David's playbook and use an analogy. And so just imagine that appreciation is kind of like using a sailboat and cash flow is kind of like using an engine in your boat. Now, personally, I like to have both. Like I like to benefit from appreciation and from cash flow. But let's look at the pluses and minuses of each. With a sailboat, you can control some things. You can control how much sail you use, what type of sail. Just like with a property, you can choose where you buy a property. You can choose the type of property you buy, the neighborhood you buy in. You can choose to fix it up in a certain way, and that will influence how much the price of your property goes up. But ultimately, you have to depend on the wind. You have to depend on the market. You have to depend on the overall prices, interest rates, financing. Those things are completely out of your control. And you might find yourself in the doldrums with zero wind in a, in a recession or a depression. And in that case, you're not going to move at all. You're not going to make any money. And that's the time when having a little engine is actually a nice thing to have. And an engine you can control. Of course, there's nothing that's 100% risk-free, but here's a few different ways that if you have, you're depending on cash flow, you can control that. Number one, getting a tenant is something you have a lot of control over. You choose how you screen that tenant. You choose what your criteria are, how good of a job they have, how much income they have, how much reserves they have, what their credit score is. That affects in a big way the reliability of the income that's coming in. And then on the expense side, you do have some control over that as well. One of the biggest controls over your, your cash flow, whether you have cash flow or don't, is your financing and how much you put down on a property. So just an extreme example, you could buy a million dollar property in San Francisco and still 
cash flow if you paid 100% down, if you paid 100% cash for that property. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but you could have a positive cash flow. So a lot of the negative cash flow, the unreliability of cash flow, often has to do with the fact that we're highly leveraged. And in that situation, yes, it is more unreliable, but to say that it's always more, less reliable is it depends on the financing, it depends on how much you put down. And then repairs are also something we'll talk a little bit about, but that's something that could be more reliable. Just think about a new construction house. If you build a house brand new, that's pretty reliable. I own a couple of rentals that are brand new and we have very few repairs and very few capital expenses. So there are things you can control. You can choose to fix up a property to a certain extent. You can choose to put money into the property up front to handle some of those things. And that makes, just like an engine in a boat, the cash flow a much more reliable source that you can depend on compared to the appreciation on a property. And here's the problem. I don't like people saying cash flow is safe. It's not. Any of us that own real estate know living off cash flow is incredibly risky and difficult to do because you don't know when things are going to go wrong. So I agree you can't always know when things are going to go wrong. I mean, like, can you predict when a roof is going to leak or can you predict that your heating and air is going to go out and you're going to have to replace it? No, you don't know exactly when that's going to happen. But my point is that you don't need to know exactly when it's going to happen. You just need to know that it will happen eventually. And I want to draw a picture for you on how cash flow works with a rental property. So you have a couple different factors here. You have your rent on the top. So you're collecting rent and every once in a while you have a vacancy when the property's empty. So let's say that's a 30 day period. And so you're going along happily and all of a sudden, bam, you have no cash flow for hopefully a month or two. And then you're back to having rent again. And then it keeps going up. And then in the future, you have another vacancy. And so you have these periods of no income coming in. That's called a vacancy. And on the bottom line, though, you have expenses. And those expenses might go along stable. And then all of a sudden, you have a big capital expense. You have that heating and air that goes out that costs five or 6,000 bucks. And that, that puts you in the negative. That's even your total expenses spike up almost like a roller coaster. And you have your expenses higher than your rent. And you go along, it's stable again, and then you have another capital expense. And so over time, you have these ups and these downs. But the bottom line, the average is a very smooth line along the bottom. The cash flow, if you average it out, is smooth. The problem and the unreliability that David's talking about, and it, it is real, are the spikes and the dips in your revenue. And so there's a couple ways to solve that. So it's not that you can't live off of your cash flow, is that you need to have reserves, especially early on in your career, you've gotta have reserves to fill that gap. So you can almost think about it like the reserves are this reservoir of water over here, and every once in a while, when the bucket's leaking too much from your rental property, you need to fill it back in. But the good part is you also have surplus periods where you have even more cash flow than the average and you can fill your, bu your bucket back up. And so that is the practical reality, especially early in your career before the rents go up and you have this kind of surplus of time as the gap of cash flow gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You have to have those reserves in order to live off your cash flow to fill those cash flow gaps in the meantime. Now, over time, so like the properties I bought in California in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 10 years ago for some of those properties, they're relatively stable because I've already fixed a bunch of stuff that has gone wrong and rents have gone up so much that as new things go wrong, it's covered by the increase in rent. All right. But the properties I bought a year, two, three ago, stuff keeps popping off and going wrong. And I got to keep fixing those properties up. And the problem is if you think you're a bad investor because you didn't anticipate that. So I agree with David that you're not a bad investor just because you failed to predict these large expenses that might pop up early on in the life of your rental property. All of us deal with that. It's called a stabilization period of your rental where you're gonna spend a little bit more of your cash flow early on than you will later. But none of that means that you have to wait years and years and years for the rent to go up and to bail you out before you can live off of it. Let me show you an example. Now let's say in this example that you buy 10 rental properties and that the total cost of all those is about a million dollars. So you spend $100,000 per rental property. You put $20,000 down, you get an $80,000 mortgage to buy the properties. So you have $200,000 total invested and $800,000 in mortgages on the properties. Overall together, you collect about $110,000 in rent over those 10 properties. And on average, let's say that your expenses are $50,000 per year. So that includes all your repairs, your capital expenses, your taxes, your insurance, your maintenance and your management, everything except for your mortgage payment. And your mortgage payment, let's say, is about $56,000 per year. That's $4,667 per month. So let's do a quick math on that. $110,000 in rent minus $50,000 in average expenses minus $56,000 in your mortgage payment. You have a net 
cash flow on average of $4,000 per year. But remember the roller coaster analogy. Those expenses are going to be higher some years and lower some years. That's the reality. And so let's say that some years you have a $60,000 expenses because you had a big repair on the roof or something. And so it's much higher than normal. In that case, $110,000 minus $60,000 in expenses minus $56,000 on mortgage payment, you'd have a negative $6,000 cash flow in that year. But then you might have another year where the expenses are only $40,000. So the operating expenses are $40,000 per year. So let's do the math on that. $110,000 minus $40,000 minus your $56,000 mortgage payment, you'd have a positive $14,000 cash flow in that year. So the point again with these real numbers is that the average might be $4,000 and how can you smooth out that curve of going down $6,000 and up to $14,000 in cash flow? The answer is you have cash reserves. If you had $10,000 in the bank in cash reserves, you could withstand that negative $6,000 in negative cash flow, and then you could refill that reserve during the positive years. That's actually what I've done, and it's been a huge relief in some years when you had those big expenses. And then, but it gives you the ability to sleep at night and the security to know you've got some buffer and you still have this cash flow coming in on a consistent basis. And like David says, over time, even 10 years later, it's even much better that you can live off the cash flow and don't even need your reserves as much at that point. This is why I personally give the advice that for the majority of BP listeners, quitting your job and going full-time in real estate is not the best thing to do. Unless you're starting a business in real estate, like you're going to become a wholesaler or a flipper or a real estate agent like me or a loan officer or a construction person, you're going to do some type of trade work or start a business that's involved in real estate. Yeah, you're full-time in real estate, but you're not a full-time investor. You're still sort of earning income. I totally agree. You shouldn't just quit your job and depend 100% on one source of income, in this case, rental property income. You should also have a plan B and a plan C. And whether that's real estate related side hustles, like getting your real estate license or some other source of income where you have a skill set, a trade that makes you money within real estate, or you could also do it outside of real estate. Having multiple sources of skills to make money as an early retiree in particular makes a ton of sense. And that's given me a lot of security, even though I don't use it all the time. I've had my real estate license. I could do bookkeeping. I could do all sorts of other businesses within real estate and outside of real estate, even when I don't have to depend on them. Knowing that you have those as a backup plan gives you a lot of security and helps you sleep at night. The answer to your question is how are people living off cash flow? They're typically living off cash flow properties they've owned for a lot longer than a year or two when they bought them. Uh, they're also typically not living off all the cash flow. They're setting aside a big chunk of it. And even then, sometimes you get hit with a bill or you get hit with a repair that's more than you have and you got to take money from your personal account. It's okay to do that. So we're starting to say the same thing here. People who live off their cash flow do set aside a certain amount for repairs, for capital expenses. They even have a reserve account. So we're both saying the same thing. I've showed you that before. The thing I think I would point out that's a little bit nuanced difference is that you can live off cash flow sooner. It's not a default. You have to wait 10 or 20 years. For most of you who have high leverage, you're putting a small amount of money down or 20% down. Yes, it's going to take some time for that little bitty cash flow to go into something bigger you can actually live off of. But that doesn't mean that somebody can't come in and just pay cash for a property or make a much bigger down payment or buy a property that produces a lot more cash flow and you can live off of it a lot sooner. So don't take a prescription like this as this is always the Way it is. I think there are a lot of situations where David is talking about is correct. You can live off cash flow sooner if you keep in mind some of the things I've talked about in this video. This is why I always tell people to take the long term approach for real estate investing. It's just, in my opinion, it's unwise, it's not prudent, and it's frankly somewhat misleading to tell people, hey, you can buy a house and you can never work again, or you can buy four houses and never work again. It's just, it's like saying you're going to plant a tree and live off the fruit forever. The, the tree needs time to produce fruit that's mature. It needs time to mature itself. So you're going to keep working while that tree is growing. So I think you can see David and I have a slightly different take on this issue. I wouldn't call it misleading that you could own four properties and retire off of that. In fact, I have a video, you can see a link above where I say just buy four. And I go through a lot of detailed numbers showing out if you just bought those four properties. And here's the caveat, though, you get them paid off. 
That's a different, I think, angle than what David's talking about here is using leverage. And once you get those properties paid off, and that does take a little bit of time to do that. Now, that doesn't happen right away. To his point, it takes some time to let those properties mature, save up the cash to pay the properties off. But if you could, if you could own four properties free and clear, I think you'd be very interested to see how much income, how much cash flow you could actually make and live off of with a very simple little small portfolio. But the important thing is that you're planting trees while you're working. What we don't want is for people to just keep going to work every day and do nothing to improve their position so that five years down the road, you're in the exact same position, but with a little less hair. So this is something that David and I agree 100% on. No matter what your end goal, no matter when or how you plan on living off cash flow, we all start with a similar early path. You've got to plant those seeds. You've got to buy those investment properties. and You've got to just get that wealth building process started. And I think you'd find if David and I were sitting next to each other, we would agree on almost everything else on the real estate investing spectrum. David is a super smart guy. He does a great job with the Bigger Pockets podcast and all his videos on the YouTube channel. I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. You've heard David's take on this issue of cash flow in real estate. You've heard my take. What's your take on this issue? I would love to hear from you below. If you like this topic of real estate cash flow, I think you'll like my next video where I go into detail and I use my whiteboard to draw out how you could retire with just four properties, a nice little simple portfolio. The video is called The Real Numbers Behind Getting Started in Rental Properties. I'll have a link above me and also below in the video description. Thanks for watching. The Coach Carson channel is all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. My name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach and I'll see you in the next video.